All right, this is a, a brand new endeavor. This thing is called Bull in the Basement, Frank. We're not in the basement. We're not in the basement. <laughs> we're, in the, we're in the harvest room, as we call it. Uh, we are at Buffalo Distilling on Seneca Street in historic Larkinville, which continues to just boom, boom, boom. And it was really cool how you and I met. It was just kind of random at, um, at Borderland at the concert there. We're just shooting the breeze. And I told you that we had this thing. And you're like, hey, let's go do this. And like, hey, you want to come to the place to do that? I'm like, well, okay, I've never done it before, but we'll try. And it's called Bull in the Basement, but we'll take it on the road. So here we are taking it on uh, the road. And uh, we're excited to be here, man. This is a great spot. Um, how long have you guys been here? Uh, we've been at this location since uh, we started moving in here in 2016. We opened the doors in 2017. So uh, once we found the spot, it took us about a year to develop uh, this, this location into what it is now. But we originally started legally in 2012 <laughs> out in uh, Wyoming County in Bennington in a little barn. So uh, it was a, uh, out there, it was more of just a glorified hobby place for us to uh, kind of learn the craft, learn the art of distilling and uh, figure out what it was to get a still going, what it was to mash and ferment and all that kind of stuff. So um, it's, it, it's, it's interesting because like, you know, you hear the stories about like um, brewers and distillers and, and almost to a guy or a girl, if that's the case, they're all like, well, yeah, you know, I was making it at home and like all my buddies were like, well, this is really good. You should maybe go into business. And then you ended up like making enough for them. And then you made enough for their friends and then their friends of theirs. And then it got to family. And then it was exploding to the point where you were like, oh, well, yeah, I got to go into business because I'm making this all this stuff for all these people and I can't even afford it anymore. Is that kind of how this happened? I mean, it sounds like this was sort of a hobby and then it kind of blew up into a business. Well, it kind of was that um, the... So the start of it, actually, it started in, the, uh, in, in North Carolina. Um, the whole thing came about uh, because a friend of the family was a moonshiner down there. So this guy, his name, he's a real guy. He goes by the name of Cowboy Bob. Come on. Cowboy Bob. So uh, my uncle uh, is in a band and was in a band called the Steam Donkeys. Know them and well. you, you know the steam dog all right yeah so they they used to travel up and down uh the east coast and and play at different bars and they started playing at this guy's bar in north carolina called cowboy bob that wasn't the name of the bar but that's the name that he goes by and at some point they uh, bob got bob had to leave town so Bob, <laughs> Bob came up to Buffalo and uh, he had become friends with the band and he always liked the way that these guys treated him and he, they, they became good friends. So he came to Buffalo and when he came up here, he brought a little homemade still with him. And that is really where the story, our story begins because Bob you know, he, he kind of was living with different people up here and the still got passed around from family, family and friends. And it, it went in people's basements. It went in people's backyards, um, around the city. And then it, it came out to my place out in Bennington. So I grew up in Wyoming County, went to Attica country boy. Um, and this still ended up in my barn, which, uh, as many, distilleries start, uh, you know, they start in somebody's barn out in the hills. So it was kind of a perfect place for this uh, endeavor to get going. So the, the still ended up there and Bob came out and he, he showed us how to use it. And it was very, you know, it was very rudimentary, but uh, you get the basics down. So this was back in like 2009, 2010 and around 2012, the laws changed in New York and they uh, made it easier to get your distilling license. So uh, you could affordably get your craft distilling license. So there's two licenses. There's the federal DSP that you get, which is 
relatively inexpensive. It's not that, that big a deal yet. And then there, there's the state license. And uh, previous to the Craft Act, the state license was pretty expensive to get. So the laws changed and what the state was trying to do was promote small breweries, wineries, and distilleries, cideries to, uh, to take root, which it, it really worked well because you see the explosion throughout the last 10 years sure. of what's been happening, all the breweries. And everything. Yeah. So, so we took advantage of that. Um, we, really didn't, we really didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. Um, we just had this place, we had a place to do it and we had a little bit of knowledge and the process. So we, uh, I always like to say my, my business partner, uh, Andy, he invested his kid's college money into buying a, 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 a big still, that, which we, we bought this still. Uh, parts of it, I'm proud to say, were made in Buffalo by Cook Metal Spinning up on uh, kind of North Buffalo area. Uh, so they, they made the copper pieces up here. And uh, my cousin, Eric, who is a steam fitter by trade, we, uh, we, we horn swoggled him into this, which I, I, yeah, I don't think he had any idea what we were getting him <laughs> into, but you're still paying him, right? <laughs> well, products? man, yeah, well, <laughs> he's, he's one of the partners here, but he, he had a lot of the fundamental knowledge of systems and how, uh, distilling is all heating and cooling. So when you have an in-house heating and cooling guy, it really made it uh, more affordable for us because, you know, that's a huge cost running all the piping, the system design, the steam, the relays, the controls, um, and then your glycol systems for cooling. So uh, Eric had a, a very intimate uh, knowledge of that stuff. He worked for, uh, he, he's a union steam fitter, so He's, he knows what he's doing, but he worked for Perry's Ice Cream for a while, and then he was at Joe Davis, then Carrier, and uh, now he uh, works for the Board of Ed. He's in charge of all the HVAC for the Buffalo Public School. So he really knows what he's doing. Um, and then my business partner, Andy, he just has a real good sense of uh, product and, and dealing with people, and he has a good vision for things. So the three of us combined, we, we, it just kind of was a really nice fit. And my uncle, John, he was the guy that kind of brought us all together. So, and he's the guy that uh, play, plays in the steam donkeys and new uh, cowboy Bob. So this little still, uh, when it was working, when we were running it, this was an illegal operation <laughs> at, uh, the time. at the time. Uh, we called, we called the, the still little Bobby. And it, part of that was a nod to Cowboy Bob. And then part of it is when, uh, when it started working, the this original little homemade still, it, it was on a, uh, a, a grate that had a, like a giant Bunsen burner under it. And it wasn't super stable. And when it would start to do its thing, it would start to kind of bob <laughs> a little bit. So we called a little Bobby. So, uh, so this was in 2012, we got the license and started uh, learning the craft out there, making uh, apple brandy, and then moving into making whiskey. And, and that's where, you know, you really start to have to learn the nuances um, because there's a lot of, there's a, there's a pretty steep learning curve when it comes to making whiskey if you're not from, um, generational distillers. I was going to ask you that that's the only thing that scares. Well, one of two things that scares me about distilling is chemistry, <laughs> which I was never good at, but I'm sure there's a lot of that involved. Physics, I'm sure is something to do with it as well. Well, science period, which I sucked at. And then R and D could probably get a little dangerous. I'm assuming in terms of tasting your product. Well, it, it, well, it can be dangerous also in a sense that you're um, turning a flammable you know, you're, you're producing a flammable vapor and a flammable liquid. So, I mean, there is a little, there is a little danger to it. Um, I, I meant the getting drunk part. Oh, the getting drunk part. <laughs> well, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> that's another story. That's, that's something that you just got to keep practicing. 
so. um, with the, with Frank here at Buffalo Distilling on Seneca Street in Larkinville. So um, obviously we'll get into what you guys do. How you this this building you're in is absolutely remarkable. Number one, how'd you find it? What there's got to be an incredible history behind it. Is there any distilling history behind it at all, or is it just a great, great old Buffalo building that you guys found and decided because you know the the, the location, Larkinville itself, with the way it's already been flourishing and continues to boom. I mean, we'll, we'll, you couldn't get a much better spot than this, man. Yeah, we really lucked out with this spot. Um, we were looking for a place to come and kind of set up shop and become a destination. And as luck would have it, I had a, a friend that worked in the Larkin building and knew the, the former owners of this. I say former owners because we just bought this property from them. But at the time, uh, the Larkin Development Group, they, they pretty much own most of the street. And they were, uh, as, as you know, they're, they're developing this area. So they were looking for somebody to uh, be, take over the spot and become a kind of a bookend between here, you know, Smith Street, and down to where they have Hydraulic Hearth and Food Truck Tuesday. And as you can see, they're, they're, they've built buildings in between there now. But we, we got really lucky. You know, I, I ran into this friend of mine who knew, knew Howard Zemsky. And she, she, she had asked, you know, we, we ran into each other. And she said, hey, what have you been up to? You know, I hear you distilling. I said, you know, we're looking for a place downtown. She's like, oh, you should call Howard have Howard's number. <laughs> She's like, here it is. Give him a call. So I, I did. And he, he picked up the phone and we met and he walked us down here. Um, and so this building, it, it looks like an old distillery. It's a, it's a cool place. You know, a lot of brick and old wood. It was built in 1890. Uh, it was called the Dutchman and Sons uh, Company. And they built carriages here. So it was a carriage factory. And uh, a lot of the, the integrity is still here. You can, you know, you could just, it, it feels like a cool. It's old gorgeous. Place. I mean, you can see the exposed brick, you know, right over my shoulder uh, and it's brick and it's wood, just like you're describing. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous historic building for people that, you know, are into that. It, this is for that all by itself is phenomenal. Anyway, that I'm sorry was, to interrupt. No, that's all right. We, uh, so we, when we got here, obviously the, the structural integrity was here but it, it needed a lot of love. It had gone through a lot of different hands throughout the years. And fortunately, everybody that owned it seemed to keep the roof intact because that's what really what gets these old buildings is when they get the water damage and it really starts to deteriorate them. But the roof was intact and it never really suffered uh, a lot of water damage. So, but it needed, it needed a ton of love so we, you know, we had to put in a sprinkler system throughout all three floors, new HVAC, uh, new plumbing, new electric, new windows, the whole works. But we did all that and we were still able to kind of keep the feel. Um, the back part of the building, which houses the, the stills and the mash tank and the fermenters, that is new. So that's the still house is like a new build. But uh, we went through and had all the rafters. Um, you know, there was the, the building's 130 years old. So there was, you know, that much time and dust up in the rafters. So what we did is we had a company come in, um, Great Lakes Effect. Uh, they do a carbon blast. They take dry ice and it's the size of like rice and it blasts the, the the material off and it sublimates so it you know you don't have that secondary you know like sandblasting mm -hmm. coming down so they they blasted the the rafters and the walls to clean it up and it, it kind of made it look almost new again so it, it took a lot of love to get it here when we built out the bar uh built out a harvest room where we can have little parties you know events tastings birthdays retirement parties so you can come in and rent the space out and you're amongst the, the barrels that you see behind us. So it, you know, it gives you that genuine feel. Uh, and plus we have a bar here. So, you, you know, you you have the space to hang out in that feels warm and cozy, and then you can get a drink. And if you want to take a tour and see how the, see how the sauce is made, 
<laughs> um, you can go back and uh, we'll give you a tour, uh, show you how uh, the whiskey or uh, vodka or whatever, you know, we're making at the time is made. So, so okay, let, let's get into uh, obviously the spirits you're distilling. Now, you, you can't see this on the camera, but I'm counting nine different bottles, three, no, four of them are actually formally labeled. The other ones are labeled with red and blue tape. Uh, and in Sharpie is, I guess, what they are. So what is the significance of, if you want to just pull one of the one of these bottles out to show in front of the camera, yeah. what's the significance of, of the red and the blue tape? Um, so our distiller, uh, he has a whiskey club. And he, these the ones with tape are just samples out of barrels that he's pulled or something that he's mixed up. Like this one that says MAP is maple aged product. So we have a uh, maple aged bourbon. We have a, a quad finished bourbon, uh, which is, uh, we'll give uh, 42 North a used bourbon barrel or a used Krupnik barrel. We make Krupnik and then we also barrel age Krupnik, which is kind of cool. Uh, and then we'll give these barrels to the beer guys. They'll age beer in it, give it back to us, and then we'll age more whiskey in it. So it's like, you know, you're getting all these uh, uses out of these barrels sure. and, you're, and you're getting these these fun products. So this one, this this quad finished, uh, this this had uh, barrel aged Krupnik in the, in the barrel. It was first started out, uh, we put bourbon in the barrel then we empty the barrel so for bourbon to be bourbon it has to go into a new charred oak barrel and there's a few other rules along with that but you can't reuse a bourbon barrel and and make bourbon you can't call it bourbon but the barrels are still good so we'll take some of our other products like the krupnik and throw it in these these barrels and age it for a little longer and you get uh it, it just makes the product uh, more nuanced more complex. So we did that with the Krupnik in a used bourbon barrel. And then we take this used Krupnik barrel and give it to 42 North and they make this quad with it. That's phenomenal. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just creamy and yummy and it's delicious. <laughs> and they give that back to us. And then we threw some whiskey in it one more time. So, you know, it's gotten four uses. Sure. And it's just a fun little, little thing we do. Um, so, so, so let me interrupt very quickly. So if you don't know this, Buffalo Distilling is most famous for their, and I have to ask you how you came up with a name, clearly, but they're famous for their one foot cock branding, if you will, uh, with multiple different whiskeys, right? And, and brandies, right? Yep. So we have, we have 15 products and uh, they all but one fly under the one foot cock banner. And and if, for those of you that don't know, there is a giant rooster out front of Buffalo Distilling, just so you know. With one foot, <laughs> one leg. <laughs> there it is. Um, so uh, the story behind the name, uh, it, it's not a family curse, like a lot of people you know, think. It's more of a, it, it has genuine roots. We, so in the little barn that we started in, out in Bennington, uh, originally we wanted the brand to coincide with the distillery name. So the name of the distillery, even though we, we were out in Bennington, we wanted, we named the distillery Buffalo Distilling. Uh, the name was available. And there was a Buffalo Distilling around in the 1800s. They, they were around from 1883 to 1914, started by uh, a gentleman uh, named Gustav Fleischmann. He was part of the Fleischmann yeast family. So a very prominent family. He came to Buffalo. He immigrated from Austria. And he came to Buffalo and took over the Ian Cook Distillery, which was one of the biggest distilleries in the area. And he renamed it Buffalo Distilling. So Gustav did that from 1883 to 1914. And I presume he had seen the, the temperance movement coming or Maybe he just wanted to retire at that point, but uh, he closed up shop in 1914, and then the name Buffalo Distilling kind of went into the, the ethos, right. you know, into the ethers of time. So that name was available, so we took it and, and relaunched it. 
And originally we wanted the brand to say, you know, Buffalo bourbon, Buffalo vodka. Uh, and we were a little naive to the, the branding procedures at the time, you know, we're some, just some guys out in the barn messing around. So we actually registered the name Buffalo bourbon. And for all of you hardcore bourbon drinkers out there, I'm sure you know what's coming next. Uh, Buffalo Trace lawyers sent us uh, letters saying we probably shouldn't use it, Buffalo at, at, at all for anything. And uh, so we, we sought some legal counsel and we went round and round with the, the Buffalo Trace lawyers, which um, someday we're going to frame some of the letters because, you know, we had fun with them a little bit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, they, they're, they were like, you know, can you, we, we really don't want to deal with you guys. Can you just direct us to your legal team? And we're like, yeah, we're, you know, we're, you know, we're three hillbillies out in the barn. So, <laughs> so we, um, we did seek some legal counsel and they said, listen, you know, you can have the name of your distillery, anything you want, but your brand cannot cause confusion. And uh, so in the barn, there was a, a decorative rooster that had one leg and we used to joke around about it. And Andy's brother, my business partner here, he's a graphic designer and he caught wind of us joking around about this one foot cock in the barn and he he made up like this mock label that was funny and it just it kind of just stuck and honestly uh, i always say i would like to you know send the buffalo trace lawyers a thank you <laughs> note because you you know you have to have something that sticks out and you have to drinking is about having fun it's you know you don't have to take it real serious you know it, you have to have a sense of humor well, you don't have to, not everybody has a sense of humor when it comes to drinking, but that's not our brand. You know, our brand is you're supposed to have, enjoy yourself, have fun, have a drink with friends. And I can't tell you the amount of times that uh, our brand has been an icebreaker for people. Sure. You know, it gets a conversation going, it's fun, it's funny. And in, in a marketing sense, we get calls from all over the world because people are like, I need this on my bar. They want it. And so it, it kind of, it wasn't like some clever marketing strategy. And it wasn't something that we were doing to try to be overly provocative, but it just fell into place. And honestly, Buffalo has a connection with the rooster, chicken wings. Um, the rooster is very agricultural in, in my eyes and distilling is very, very agricultural and that's kind of where we came from. So it all kind of fit together. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And, and if you, <laughs> I'm sure you, 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 well, maybe you are sick of it. You, if you had a nickel or a dime for every time somebody said, man, you know, I Googled one for <laughs> Yeah, Yeah, we get right? a lot of that. There's, there's definitely a lot of stories, you know, where people are, that we, we do a tasting and they're like, oh, I, you know, I seen it at the store and I was going to a party and I wanted to be the guy to show up or, right. or the woman to show up with a one foot cock. So uh, it, it goes to your point about the icebreaker. That's a no brainer, no brainer. Yeah. And you know, it, there's a lot of fun innuendo. We try to keep it classy. We're not out to try to, you know, hit anybody over the head with it. Yeah. We just, we're trying to, it's a, it's a fun brand and we have an amazing graphic designer who has, uh, throughout the years, we've had a lot of different uh, versions of the label. And this is the latest and she just, she killed it, man. I mean, this is, ah, this, 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 this label is. is yeah, that's gorgeous. Up. Yep. Uh, I don't know if you can kind of yeah. see it with the shine, but it's very Art Deco. So it's, it, it, it just works for us. And it, every, every time that we, we upgrade the, uh, the design or come out with a new product, we have a little more that we can throw behind it to kind of make it uh, look the part. But uh, we like to say it's the spirit that rises to the occasion. <laughs> for sure. Uh, we're at Buffalo Distilling on Seneca Street, Larkinville. Frank's with us. Um, so, okay, I'm going to stereotype. You say this thing started in a barn. And I think you kind of described it the very onset of of our discussion um in north carolina you know moonshining so was shine what you guys started with or was it something else that you graduated to or vice versa uh, before 
So before it was one foot cock or before we were selling to the public, it was, it was shine. You know, we were making like a whiskey, uh, a sugar wash shine. Um, and then we moved into making brandy because when we first started, we didn't have a fermenter and, uh, well, we didn't have a mash tank either, a mash tank or a fermenter. So brandy is very easy to make because all you need is, uh, you know, like, like an apple. We took apple cider. So we went and had apples pressed and then made hard cider. And my family had been making hard cider for years. You know, we just made it for us. So we had some knowledge on how to make that. It's fairly easy. Um, so we took that fermented apple wine, hard cider, and put it in the still. And the first product we came out with was apple brandy. And uh, from there, we moved on to making a, a bourbon. And then it wasn't until we got downtown that we made vodka because you, need, you really need a tower. You need a plate still. So we just had the old-fashioned Alembic style still uh, out at the barn. And... You know, we were playing around with different uh, mash bills, corn, rye, malted barley, corn, wheat, malted barley, different levels of barley malt, different levels of unmalted barley, different grinds. So I, I always like to compare, you know, making, making alcohol, making whiskey is kind of like, it's like playing the guitar. There's a million different ways to do it. There's a million different notes, how you hold the guitar you know, in comparison to how you extract your distillate, the shape of your still, how long the arm is, how the temperatures you go up to, how long you cook it at. There's just a million different ways to do it, just like there's a million different ways to play music. Um, and the conditions, the water that you use, the adjustments that you make to the water. Um, it's, it's always been kind of personal for us because you know, all the brand aside and all the kidding aside, I, you know, I grew up, I went to Attica. A lot of my friends were farmers. I got to go to them when we were getting this going and say, Hey man, you know, can I use some of your product? Will you sell me some grain? Yeah. And that was really cool. You know, like going to them, people that I grew up with bringing me grain that they grew in the, on their family farm and then were able to use it uh and turn that into something fun for people to drink so not only the grain but we also use maple syrup in some of our products we use maple syrup to make our drinks uh we make a maple age whiskey one of our whiskeys we we give our used bourbon barrels to a maple syrup producer that i, I went to high school with he ages maple syrup in it gives us empties it gives us those barrels back and then we finish bourbon in it and it, it makes a maple a maple cask bourbon which is you know, delicious yeah sure. yeah and i'll have you try some that would be good um <laughs> you know and then we we also work with apiaries for our krupnik so buffalo being a huge polish demographic we make a honey it's like a citrus honey liqueur which is really popular amongst our our polish uh constituents here and that's all local honey. And it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's the best honey that I've ever tasted. Uh, our apples, we make an apple brandy. We don't make as much apple brandy anymore. It's, it's kind of, it's very costly to make, um, but we go up to Smith Orchards in Pendleton uh, and we've gotten juice from him. It's a small orchard. So everything that we do is, you know, it, it starts in the fields of our farming community. And, and that really, that means a lot to us. You know, it, it's, it's something that kind of brings you back. There's almost a romanticism about it. And, and we take a lot of pride in that. Yeah. So. It's rootsy, obviously for you, clearly. Um, I got to ask you about palate maturation. Um, I have always generally been a beer guy and then, you know, and, and I want to be a whiskey guy. Uh, and I haven't gotten there, like in terms of sipping. Um, cause I'm one of those guys that if I have a drink in my hand, I'm drinking it. Right. So for me to sip, so I'm waiting, I'm trying to, and I'm not a young man. 
And I'm trying to figure out when am I going to get to that level when I can just sit there with a nice, you know, snifter and just have a, a, a nice drink and just enjoy it instead of worrying about when the next one's coming. You know what I mean? Like, let's start right now. Okay, here we go. This is good. The lessons in drinking. <laughs> I, you know, I, I think, uh, I think it just, it boils down to uh, not being in a hurry and, you know, savoring the moment. And, uh, and once you start trying different whiskeys, that's when you start deciding what you like. And I don't believe in, you know, being in the whiskey world, I don't believe in there being a best. I've always said the best is what's in your hand. The best is what you like. The best is whatever fits your palate. Um, so, all right. So we're gonna we're gonna pour some things here. So this is a um, this is a port finished rye. A port finished rye. Okay. And we're at one hundred and six proof. Okay. So we'll just sip on that. Yeah, that sounds good. All right. Salute. Yeah. So for 106, that doesn't that doesn't burn, right? No. It's got a nice finish. Yeah. It. Very nice finish. Not not too uh, not too hot. No, that's yeah. fine. That's not bad at all. Actually. Yeah. It's smooth. That's really smooth. Yeah. So that a port finish is it is exactly as it sounds. You would take a whiskey and whether it's been aged in a new barrel or a used barrel, you're a popular thing to do. And they, they do it with a lot of scotches and they're doing it more and more with bourbons is to take that product that's already been aged and put it in a secondary barrel um, that once had like a port wine or a sherry and let it pick up those light notes from from the wines or the, the different alcohols that were in them previously. So it just gives it a little, it rounds it out a little. So when you have a product that's uh, higher proof, you're gonna get a lot deeper notes in there. But typically, if you're not used to drinking a high proof alcohol, it might, you know, it might be a little hot for some yeah, people. Yeah, yep. But, uh, but you get, the more you cut it down to a lower proof, the more you're obviously watering it down. Yep. So you lose some of that characteristic. Got it. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's that's the port. That's delicious. I think this is. And I'm also going to ask you, and I'm sure you know this because you've explained a lot of the science. And you know, for people that are watching this and, and don't know the science of of distilling. Um, what, why, I'm assuming you know, but why is it that certain spirits affect people in different ways? Do you, you know, like a, 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 a dark compared to a clear, compared to let's say a tequila, um, why do certain spirits affect people in different ways? I, I honestly think that's all in people's heads, but I don't know. I, I, well, I, I know, don't know. I know for a fact that brown liquors, I, I respond differently to them than I do clear liquors. I know that for a fact, and my wife can attest to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be what's going on. Well, maybe there's different situations going on where you're drinking a clear liquor as opposed to a brown liquor. I will say I do tend to get a little, I, of course, I can't say for sure, but you know, when I drink tequila, I do tend to have a really good time, but I guess I could say that about drinking whiskey too. So, but okay. But uh, so there is no, to your knowledge, there is no direct science as to why one affects a person I, differently. You know, I, I believe that ethanol is ethanol. Yeah. Um, I have heard, I don't know if there's any scientific evidence that tequila affects people differently. Uh, but I don't know if that's an old wise tale, right. you know, uh, that tequila is an upper and all the other uh, alcohols are downers. But 
uh, that is, that's a good point. I don't know. There might be some kind of scientific study done to that, but I don't know uh, for sure on my end. Well, uh, I mean, tequila agave, obviously, and then, you know, all of these other so, liqueurs we're talking about obviously have all different makeups, clearly, and chem chemically, they're, they're, they're different. So maybe that has something to do with it. I have no idea. What, why am I even talking about Well, this? so, <laughs> you know, the, the, the alcohol that goes into a barrel starts out clear. It comes out of the still clear. Um, so for, for vodka to be vodka, it has to emerge from the still at 190 plus proof. For whiskey, for bourbon in particular, it can't come out of the still higher than 165. So basically you can, you can take a whiskey product and turn it into vodka. You just have to distill it a few more times. Or if you have a, a real big uh, tower, you can run it through once and just activate all the plates and get it out at 190. But uh, that's the, the, so the interesting thing about vodka is vodka can be made from anything. You know, anything that has sugar, you just have to get it to its neutral. I mean, you can make it out of anything. Uh, whiskeys, you have to, well, at least for bourbon, it has to be at least 51% corn. Uh, but the mash bill can be whatever you want it to be. It just has to be at, at least 51% mm -hmm. corn for bourbon. Uh, so, but basically it's, it's all, you know, it's all ethanol. It's all uh, the same kind of chemical. That you would put in your, in your car. Well, <laughs> yeah. You don't advise of. it, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, you know, there's definitely differences between potable and non-potable, right. but, uh, but it, it, it will work the same way, yes. Okay, uh, so what's our next, what's our next uh, thing we're going to try? Uh, we're going to try, uh, this, is, this is some distiller's reserve. So this is the good stuff is what you're telling me. Well, this is, I just found it from the back of the still house. <laughs> I just still had it laying around, so. Uh, you got to be very careful, by the way. When I walked in here, you were driving around. I don't even know what the hell you call that that <laughs> thing you were driving around with the, the forklift or whatever it is. But you were maneuvering that thing like around your stills and with in nooks and crannies of the back building of the still room. And I have you must have gone through some specific training or had some accidents in the in the process because you did that really well. I was like, wow, I, I was nervous for you when you were doing it. But uh, anyway, well. You, you got to be good uh, with this brand. You got to be good at uh, putting. I can't see it. I have no idea. So never mind. <laughs> All right. So this is the distilled reserve. Yeah. What proof is this? This is 90. Okay. Wow. Soft barrel notes. Oh, yeah. Little hints of vanilla. I was going to say, how do you. And, you know, you hear people, your sommeliers in the wine world do it. And, and obviously people in your world do it and talk about, well, it's got a flavor of fill in the blank fruit. It's got a, you know, oh, it's, there's some lavender in there and there's, you know, fill in the blank. And, and so you have just developed that ability over years, time, right? To, to be able to say, wow, it's got this, 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 and this, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just basically. Because it's not obvious for, for I, I'm well, not a you, nuanced drinker. So it's not for me. Yeah. But what, what, what do you taste? I mean, when you think about it, what what are, what are the profiles that come to mind? What uh, what's something that uh, you would that strikes up in your mind? Something similar, like a, uh, there's there's a lot of the basic stuff, like your vanillas, your caramels, and a lot of that comes from the sugars that are in the wood. Right. So when you when you take a barrel and you char it, you're bringing the sugars out of the wood. Uh, you're 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 bringing it into the char. And when you fill a barrel and let it sit, so this is kind of the romantic part about whiskey is, and it's something that you really can't cheat. And there's companies that are spending lots of money on R&D. And to my knowledge, I haven't tasted anything yet that has uh, been cheated, so to speak, uh, in terms of age. So. You know, they, they spend money on trying to hyper age things, but I, I haven't seen anything that has matched natural maturation. And 
what happens during natural maturation is you have, th there's different chemical processes going on in the barrel. You have, uh, you have the alcohol going in and out of the wood as the temperature and humidity change. So you want wild temperature fluctuation. You want humidity fluctuation because what that does is it drives that alcohol in and out of that char inside the barrel and you have oxidation, you have esterification, you have evaporation. Um, and one of the other things that's very interesting, if you were to take a glass of alcohol and put it on a table out in the air um, and then come back to it the next day and, and, and drink it, it would taste like it was watered down. In the air, the, the alcohol evaporates faster than the water. But in a barrel, the exact opposite happens. And that's, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, so that's why the proof in a barrel actually goes up. If you have a good barrel, the proof will go up because the water molecules are smaller than the alcohol molecules. And they'll evaporate slightly faster through the wood. So that's, you know, that's just, it's, it's so cool. It's just, I, I always, I love telling people that because, uh, you know, it's just like this fun little fact that that's yeah. hard to cheat. Yeah. Right. I was going to say, if you needed um, your edition of Bill Nye, the science guy, you've gotten it uh, <laughs> today with Frank. Oh. So yeah, this is good stuff. Mm. Um, one other thing that I, I told you about when, when we met was mafia sauce. So obviously yes. everybody's all about the bills, right? Yes. And you have created this mafia sauce, which I saw randomly and I knew it was Buffalo distilling. So I'm like, I'm going to get that. We're going to try that. Right. So we got it. And you, you want to pull the bottle over just to show folks if they don't know what it is. Um, clearly there it is. It's got the, it's got the Zubaz logo thingamajig. There we go. But it is remarkable. And I got to tell you, uh, it is, Table breaking good. <laughs> My wife and I, for the opener, made uh, Jello shots with that. Ah, yeah, yeah. And they were delicious. It was, uh, you know, you just replace the. Uh, it's one cup of your boiling water and one cup of that, yeah. and it, and we were on, and it was phenomenal. Oh, so I strongly suggest if you're doing, you know, a tailgate or a party responsibly, obviously, um, get whatever kind of flavored jello you like. Throw in the the, the mafia sauce as that half. And man, is it delicious. We've gone through a number of bottles, trust me. I haven't had the Jello shot yet, but I, I would like to try it. Um, yep, so the Mafia sauce, a little background on it. Uh, we, uh, we saw kind of the, the, the gap in the spirits offering that was a, you know, a football kind of based spirit, we'll say. Uh, in the local market and you know we're proud of the city we're proud of the bills we're proud of uh what's going on and uh, you know th that energy at the end of the season yeah. in the city especially i live in allentown it was it was awesome nice. man i mean they shut down allen and elmo right people were partying in the street i saw the video it yeah. was bonkers it was awesome so you know we wanted to we wanted to take part in that obviously and so we came up with kind of our, our version. It's kind of like, almost like a Pink Whitney kind of thing, but uh, in more in the sense of a uh, Gatorade, like basically it's kind of modeled after Cherry Glacier Gatorade. So a sports drink flavored vodka. Um, but the really, the, the coolest part about this and the thing that is, that we can kind of hang our hats on here and it, it, it's almost uh for me it, it, it's almost life-changing honestly is the fact that we uh, we work with the punt foundation on this sure very good friends of mine and in that meeting those folks over there gwen and the team um it puts a lot of perspective into life and so when we were coming up with the idea for mafia sauce you know, that, that word mafia means something in this town. And we didn't want to just hop on that bandwagon. So we came up with the concept. And before we launched it, I reached out to Del Reed and said, hey, Del, here's what, you know, 
here's what we're doing. Can we meet up and make, you know, basically pay respect to him and, and the mafia uh, folks? Fan base, yeah. Yeah, the fan base. Yeah. And say, how do we, how do, we um, do this right? How do we uh, make this, you know, part of the, the mafia ethos? And he said, you got to give back. So um, he recommended a few different places and Punt was one of them. And immediately it was like, you know, I met, met them and then I met some of the people that they work with and it, it, it sets you back. It, you know, it, it's such a beautiful organization what they're doing. So we decided, all right, for every bottle we make, we're going to make a donation to them. And um, so at the end of the bill season, it, actually we're going to do it at the end of the year. Uh, we're going to announce and we'll have a, a thing where we cut them a check. Right. The big giant oversized yeah. check. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Do you, do they still do that? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Okay. So, yes. But, uh, so, but that's, you know, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. So now you, we have this thing where, you know, and you, all the beer guys are, that came out with this cool stuff, you know, all the different beers related to the mafia and, and the bills. And now we have a spirit. So instead of drinking fireball or something that's made by a conglomerate from out of town, we're drinking, you know, you can do a shot of something every time the bill score, which, all right, we're probably going to be doing a lot of shots. I was going to say, lately it's been a lot. <laughs> uh, but, you know, and you could feel good about, uh, about doing it, you know, because it's, it's supporting the community. And uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, that's been awesome. a, it's been a cool thing. Yeah, and punt for folks that don't know, basically helps out families of children who have pediatric cancer. So, um, you know, everybody knows in this town because of children's and because of Oshai, or, well, it is Oshai, obviously, uh, in Roswell and all of that, they know that, you know, there's so many kids in this town that are going through it. They know the cost of healthcare this, these days is not inexpensive at all. And this helps those families get through some of the processes now. Uh, and it helps them with things like, you know, groceries and gas and rent and mortgage payment. It's not just like, we're going to, you know, throw money at you so you can pay your, pay your bills. No, this is for a different kind of bills, like your everyday actual living. So the Pun Foundation is, is great for that. It really is. Uh, started by former Bills kicker, Brian Mormon. Um, and I can't say it enough how well it's run. It's just, they're, you meet these people and they're just, they exude love. They exude, they're just people that you trust and you want to hug they're just amazing yeah um so that's why i said it, it's it's almost touching yeah you know uh when when you get involved with something like that so and, and, and i don't know about you and i i've i've only lived here about 20 years but i gotta say in the last at least five years just the the moniker of city of good neighbors and just the give back of people in this town has gone from you know here to here it's been remarkable i mean it starts with the Andy Dalton thing, yeah, right? Exactly. And then the last three years or four years, it's been remarkable how people have just answered the call yeah. time in and time out for when people are in need. It's remarkable. And here's another great opportunity for, for people to do that. So it's, uh, it's viral it's, yeah. and it's contagious. Yeah. And it, it, it really, people, people have always said this, but like you said, I think it's more pronounced now that people in Buffalo want to help each other out yep. we are the city of good neighbors man you know so it's it's you know especially people that move away and then you know they, most of the time they come back yep. they're, grass they're, you is, know grass isn't always greener that's right but 100%. uh they move away and they say yeah, man, i miss the people might not miss, miss the weather but man you miss the people so, so in, in the in the beer world um you see a lot of collaborations right you already mentioned you've been working with 42 north in that respect and it is, is there still that same um, sort of respect level? And because you see a lot of the local craft breweries kind of working together, right? And, and they all seem to be, there will be a, a, a beer show with 40 local beers that, and everybody's cool and whatever. Is that the same? And granted, and I, I don't even know how many distilleries are in Western New York, mm -hmm. not probably a handful or a little more than that. Yeah, there's a handful. Um, yeah, we all, you guys all good. We're all good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. We all get along. We all try to help each other out. I yeah. actually uh, just lent a, a piece of equipment to a guy out in Akron who's uh, he's, he, you know, he's starting, starting out kind of like we did in a little, smaller barn and uh you know he had some questions that we kind of had to 
when we first started, we had to do a lot of R&D to figure these things out. And you know what, man, if you can help and it helps somebody else out, it, I don't look at it as competition. I look at it as the more you have in a, uh, the more you have of one thing in an area, the more it draws people in. So if Buffalo has 50 breweries and 20 distilleries, well, when you're taking a trip and you're deciding where you want to go, oh, well, we can go to Buffalo and they got this, this, and yeah. this, and this brewery yeah. and this distillery. I want to check this yeah. out. So it's a draw yeah. and it's, 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 it's a good thing. Um, you have any uh, events, collabs, anything you want to tell people about? Well, yeah. well I got you here. Yeah. So we're, uh, we're doing our our Empire Rye release uh, next week. It's next Saturday. I think that's the ninth. Is it next Saturday the ninth? Um, where we're releasing the first rye. Uh, I believe it's the first rye ever made in Buffalo um, from start to finish. So uh, all local uh, New York rye. Uh, Empire rye is its own designation. So it has to be made with rye grown in New York, has to be barreled at 115 proof or less in a new charred oak barrel. S similar rules to bourbon, but just with rye. Um, so we're doing that release. We're only releasing 300 bottles and that's it. Wow. So that's the Saturday edition. Yeah. So yeah, cool. uh, that's coming up. And uh, uh, that, uh, and then at the end of the month, we're having Slip Madigan play. Uh, if, I don't know if anybody... Uh, if any of you guys know them, but uh, they're a great band. They're playing at the distillery Saturday, uh, the 30th here. So that'll be a good show. Probably your big Halloween throwdown. Uh, I, I think, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess it's going to be a Halloween throwdown. Yeah. Um, roll through like the, the hours, the socials, the website, yep. all that stuff for yep. folks. Uh, Instagram, Buffalo underscore distilling. Um, Facebook, Buffalo distilling, uh, Buffalo distilling.com. Uh, 860 Seneca Street in Larkinville, right down the road from where they have Food Truck Tuesday. Um, we have uh, bar hours Thursday, uh, 3 to 9, Friday, 3 to 10, and Saturday, 1 to 10. So you can come in, get a great cocktail. We have some fun, uh, great craft cocktail guys that, that just like to have a good time. Uh, and then you can do a tour and a tasting uh, Monday through Saturday. Uh, you can come in. We have retail hours, so we open at we open the doors at ten on Monday. Come in, grab a bottle, uh, get a tour, and uh, have a try a sample of alcohol. Um, thank you for my samples of alcohol. Yeah. They were fantastic, and I will probably have a couple more after I shut this thing off. Uh, <laughs> but I got to tell you one last thing. Um, this is actually a great spot, and, and granted, it's a little bit long, especially in the winter time. But if you ever wanted to do any kind of a air quotes, crawl. Friends of mine and I started one here, then made our way down the street, down Seneca. You could, you could fluctuate if you wanted to, but we went down Seneca and all the way downtown and, you know, got some breweries and whatever. And, but we started here. This is a great spot. If you were going to do any kind of a crawl to start here, get into it a little bit and make your way down to whether it's, you know, flying by and down the street or Beltline or whoever. And if you wanted to go across one night at G. McCarthy, however yeah. you wanted to do it, it, it is. It's it. You, I'm glad you said that because we have, we literally have flying bison right next door. We have lots of parking and so do they. Uh, then you have Beltline, you have Genie's, you have Buffalo Brewing right there. Yep. That he makes great beer. Beltline makes great beer. Genie's beer is phenomenal. Great food. Yeah. Hydraulic hearth there. Go visit Danny, get a great cocktail. Um, yeah. It's, it's a cool little, little neighborhood. You know, and it's only getting better. And then you can grab a donut too, right next That's door right. at Paula's. So. How did I not mention Paula's right yeah. next door? So, and then there's uh, there's a little uh, a beer place opening up, like uh, kind of like a, a fatties, I think, mm -hmm. type thing. Yeah, a, a beer Buffalo or Buffalo uh, Bear. Uh, I, there's a we'll, well find out. Yeah, he's we'll uh, find out. he's opening up in Larkinville too. Like, a when little, is the uh, collaboration with Paula's going to happen? <laughs> you know what? I would love to do a Krupnik cream donut, uh, a Krupnik fill, like a where they take the essence of Krupnik and make some kind of a, a donut out of it. You could probably awesome only sell it here. I'm guessing. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> but that would be cool. Or maybe right. like a, a, a peanut brittle whiskey or something. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I would love to do it. That'd be cool. That'd be cool. 
Well, hey, man, listen, uh, thanks for having This is great. This is so much fun. Uh, let's do it again sometime. Yeah, yeah. Thanks and, for coming uh, in. I appreciate the tastings. We'll do uh, some more. Buffalo Distilling, Seneca Street here in Larkinville. You can't miss it. I mean, this uh, neighborhood's booming. If you've been down here, you know it. If not, stop here. Get yourself some one-foot cock. Get yourself some mafia sauce. Get the new rye at the end of the week. And, uh, well, this has been our first on-the-road installment, bull out of the basement. Thanks, man. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. A little cock and bull. There you go. <laughs>